I'm very, very happy to welcome all of you to this evening panel discussion. And um, as some of you might know, this is the first event by the newly founded Student Journal Network Berlin Exchange, which gets us even more excited about tonight, beyond the fact that we have four wonderful guests with us. Ulrich Dirnagel, Michael Friedmann, Lara Urban and Michael Häfner with whom we will discuss different nuances in different approaches to and different visions of current and future peer review. But before we get started with introducing ourselves, the topic and the speakers in greater depth, I'd like to point out a few organizational issues. Now, who is Berlin Exchange? As this is our first event, we want, use the, uh, want to use the opportunity to make a little advertisement about who we are and what we do. We are uh, three student journals from Berlin, but coming from completely different disciplines. So we are Anwesenheitsnotiz from the humanities, Polos Reflects from international relations and Berlin Exchange Medicine, our initiator and name giver from the life sciences. We all publish student works and therefore encourage students to not uh, despair upon their insignificance to real life research, but to engage early in scientific discourse. We set up Berlin Exchange as a network and a platform for us as the journals to exchange our experiences, share resources and host fun events like this. The project is advised by uh, the Berlin University Alliance and is located in their objective fostering knowledge ex exchange. And at this point, we also want to send many, many thanks to Gerrit Rösler and Mark Dewey, who have encouraged and helped us a lot during the last weeks and months and during the whole founding process. And many, many thanks to the Berlin University Alliance in general for allowing and supporting this unusual type of student project. I also want to thank all the members of um, the Great Berlin Exchange Board who made the project and in general and this event in particular possible and all the people who spread the word so that we see so many of you here tonight. So before I hand over to Anne, just a few words on me. I'm Elisabeth. I'm doing a master in philosophy at the Humboldt University and as a member of Berlin Exchange, I represent the journal Anwesenheitsnotiz, being part of their editorial team since 2016. That's it. Thank you for listening patiently to these introductory words. I'm looking forward to the discussion and I hand over to Anna. Thank you, Ellie. I'm, I also take the chance to introduce me myself quickly. I'm a medical student at Charity and Got involved in research, especially because of my doctoral thesis, but got quite fascinated by it now being in global digital health and health financing. And yeah, both Ellie and me, but also all team members, we as students in research have been put into a system of peer review that often pretends to be kind of unchangeable. But at the same time, at that time when we founded Berlin Exchange, voices got louder that criticized peer review as it is currently practiced. And that's a discussion that can be known to the general public thanks to the pandemic and all the discussions about preprints and all of that. So it's not only the insufficiencies regarding objectivity, equitable access, paying respect for null results and so on. It is also the fact that science is practice more and more interdisciplinary and that poses a challenge to peer review. So as student journals, we are trying out innovative approaches to peer review. And we have that privilege in that student context that we can have the freedom to establish kind of unconventional or brave approaches to peer review. And that's where the idea came from that we would like to invite experts in that field and we found four very interesting experts all from different disciplines all impressive researchers 
and all involved in peer review criticism and or peer review innovation. So we would like to start the discussion or the evening with a round of introduction of our panel, but we would also like to use this round to enable you as listeners to get into tonight's topic, imagining peer review for an interdisciplinary future. So we will give our panelists the word to share their background, but also let them introduce you to what we will be talking about in the, in the rest of the time. So I'd like to first turn to Professor Ulrich Dienage. He is the director of the Department of Experimental Neurology at the Charité in Berlin, but he's also the founding director of the Quest Center for Responsible Research at the Berlin Institute of Health. And that's, that's a place where very interesting research on research happens. And well, you're also responsible for putting this idea in our heads to establish a modern peer review and to critically discuss the current one. And I remember besides an enlightening meeting, meeting with you at the very beginning of BEM, of Brain Exchange Medicine, it was this article on your blog that we all read titled Peer Review is Dead, Long Enough Peer Review. So could you take us into why you think that peer review is a necessity for scientific culture? Um, yeah, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. I think that's a, uh, is a very important question that you're asking, peer review, quo vadis. Um, and as you just mentioned, it's, it's on, on the minds of many people and, and I'm also very interested in it. Not sure whether it's a good idea that I started off because um, people who know me know that I like to be provocative. And uh, today I feel the urge uh, to uh, say mostly that peer review is dead. Um, and let me make my point. And, and this is maybe just to kick off a controversial discussion. I could give, I could take the same position for peer review, but I don't want to mix things now. So I'm, I'll, I'll just kick it off by saying what I think is, is a problem. And, and let me uh, give you sort of the perspective from which I'm doing this. I have uh, published, I guess, more than 300 peer reviewed papers. For this occasion, I calculated that in my life, I think I reviewed around 3000 papers. Um, I was uh, a chief editor of a, of a scholarly journal for 10 years uh, on many editorial boards, and I'm still on the editorial board of both biology and of uh, the, the British Medical Journal Open Science and also of EMBO Press. Um, so I think I know what I'm talking about. And what I would like to say is that every paper gets published. And so peer review doesn't work as a filter. It's, I know the ideal, we can talk about the ideal, and it's a beautiful ideal, but it just doesn't work. Last week, or I think it was two weeks ago, the Journal of Biological Chemistry, which is a highly reputed uh, scholarly journal, has retracted 129 papers, most of them produced by paper mills. They, they went through, I mean, through this, this is a society, they review these papers, and, and they were produced by paper mills and were just non-existent. They were... There are these semantic word generators that produce articles and they will get published in scholarly journals. So um, peer review is intransparent, it's slow, it's resource intense, it's post fact, the, the, the major mistakes have been made. Um, it's often unprofessional, we don't learn it, it's just it's something that kind of you just do it. Um, it's not taught. What is peer review? Peer review is a triage system that helps to stratify papers into different tiers of reputation, nature, science, scholarly journals, plus one and the rest. And it's quantified by the journal, of, journal impact factor. The, the impact factor is, is the currency of the academic system. Um, how does it work? We, we give our work for free to publishers and what we get back, in fact, we buy it back by uh, open access charges or by library uh, prescriptions. Uh, we buy it back so the taxpayer foots the bill 
as curated articles with an attached impact factor. And this impact factor we use to buy third-party funding and academic positions. So whole fields are doing without it. So think physics, think archive. Yesterday, we, the Einstein Foundation gave the first Einstein Award for the um, promotion of quality in research. Um, it's a 500,000 euro prize, uh, the 200,000 go for the individual, uh, to Allen Ginsberg, who in 91 started um, Archive. So domains in physics do without any, so, so the whole dissemination of knowledge is done without peer review. So I think that's just proof of concept that in principle, <laughs> this is possible. Um, so Quo Vadis, peer review. I think we will go preprints. We will go peer reviewed preprints, by the way. Most people don't know this, but this is that this this is a thing that's going on, and it's I think it's it has a big future. Post publication and open peer review, if we want to do peer review, registered reports, which is actually where we where we review studies before they have been done, um, and many other things. So so this is a very active thing, and and we can talk about it. I think uh, there, there's a lot of excitement uh, and exciting stuff. Uh, but the peer review, as 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 it as it were, and as we have it right now, I think is um, should not should not be maintained. But as as I've said, it's uh, producing a currency, which is critical um, to the academic system, and this is its life uh, insurance, and that's also the life insurance of the publishers. And as long as we don't change this. Um, we will see interesting changes and, and some new things coming up like preprints, but this will not, these will not be game changers. Okay, so sorry for, <laughs> for a rather dramatic <laughs> entry into this discussion. I don't want to spoil uh, the whole thing. There is a lot of positive stuff to be said about peer review. I just didn't want to say it. Okay, thank you, Oli. Uh, for these in, super already super interesting um, insights on peer review, ah, I'm so looking forward to the discussion. Okay, but our next panelist is uh, Michael Friedman. Michael is a historian and a philosopher of mathematics, and his research focus is on how material, visual, and symbolical knowledge interact with each other. He has been research associate at the Berlin Research Cluster and self-proclaimed interdisciplinary laboratory image knowledge gestaltung. And he is research associate at the follow-up cluster, Matters of Activity. And he will be senior lecturer in Tel Aviv from January on. So Michael, having spent so many years in interdisciplinary environments, can you share some insights from this culture and what do you think is the biggest challenge when working in interdisciplinary contexts? Yeah, okay. First of all, thanks Elizabeth and Anna for the invitation. I very much look forward to, um, to the discussion. I have a, just to, to be even more provocative uh, and react immediately uh, to what uh, Professor uh, Dingal said. I actually see a much more pessimistic and darker future for the system. Because if we'll be honest, um, once one would like to get tenure track inside the academic system, um, most of, uh, of the articles that are being counted should be peer reviewed eventually. So I, I know it pretty much by heart because uh, as Elizabeth said, I'm in the process of getting into this academic system. And pretty much the first thing that is being clarified is that the publication should be peer reviewed and they should be also at what is called Q1 or tier one of the journals. So I don't see, unless the entire academic system will completely change and the universities themselves will change and how they actually rank professors, um, I'm, I'm much more pessimistic, but I'm pessimistic in any case, that's my nature. So in, in that sense. Um, 
Let's move on to interdisciplinarity. Uh, I think the biggest challenge is actually, um, and this is something that I notice when uh, when we talk about peer review, uh, because peer review is mostly used in this context, maybe implicitly only for the natural sciences, but obviously there are there is also preview for uh, the humanities. And I think the biggest challenge uh, in these, um, these excellence clusters, which aim from the beginning of being interdisciplinary, is that the, the, the communities will be able to speak with each other. Uh, and by communities, I mean that the, the natural scientists with, the, with people from the humanities. Um, just to give a, a very short example, in the first cluster um, where I was, we actually had a reading group uh, composed of people from the humanities and natural scientists and we actually spent two years of meeting pretty much every week of reading writings of each other and writing of philosophers and physicists etc of even understanding what they're doing um, and it takes a lot of time and this is actually the major risk here uh, because time is an asset that you cannot underestimate and postdocs don't have time that's clear you're always uh, running after the next job or the next opportunity um, and this is a major risk um, and obviously with respect to um, peer reviewing this is um, i think interdisciplinary research uh, also with um, when you publish interdisciplinary papers um, the question is who is the public? Uh, who will read them? And uh, obviously, if you're a postdoc, uh, what kind of well, benefits or rewards are you getting from that? Um, because eventually you do want to get a job. Um, and there are no, or hardly, let's call it interdisciplinary departments. Um, yeah, so, and, and, and I can, well, expand on that later, um, but uh, I, I certainly agree that the, the academic system needs a revision. I'm not sure which actually, uh, apart from destroying it completely um, and rebuilding it, but um, we'll see that later. Thanks. I'm very much looking forward to whether publishing gets destroyed at the end of this discussion. And I now turn to Lara, Lara Urban, Urban however, um, who had to get up very early today. And that's because she currently is an independent research fellow at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And she has a background in statistical and conservation genomics. And, and that's why we got in, in touch with her. She's a member of the Early Career Advisory Group at eLife and of the Preprint Working Group at eLife. So I will let her explain more about this cryptical sounding eLife thing. So Lara, how do the approaches at eLife rethink peer review and what role do early career researchers have in that process? Yeah. Um Thanks uh, as well for inviting me, Elizabeth and Anne. Just based on the introductions, I think this is going to be a really exciting uh, discussion uh, with everyone. So, uh, Eli, firstly, is a, um, sci a scientific journal. So, it's, it, it publishes research itself. It's based in the biomedical and, um, and also medical op um, in general life sciences um, area. So, this is also where I am from. So, I guess this is sort of the perspective that I can bring in. Um, plus, I'm, as Anne mentioned, also still an um, early career researcher. So, I'm currently um, a research fellow, um, as Anne mentioned. I'm actually coming back to Germany next year to build my own group here. But um, I think I'm very much, you know, at the, at the beginning of my scientific career. So, um, eLife, however, tries to be a lot more than just a scientific uh, journal. So um, it also tries to push the boundaries of science on other levels. So especially, obviously, as a journal, it has to think about how it realizes um, the, the actual peer review and publication system. And eLife has really introduced this very revolutionary idea of um, to first publish and then review model, which is basically what Uli referred to as the post-publication peer review, which means you, you firstly um, really um, put your work out there, you get feedback, 
um, for it. And then at the end, um, uh, like it's being curated on, on some sort of open access uh, website, um, which means that uh, you basically don't have the system that you end up just having the peer review for classifying your manuscript into one of these like tiers and looking into how much impact it has, but everything should be available on the same platform and you will always have access to the manuscript as well as to the openly accessible peer review, which means that uh, it's really everything transparent of uh, what is good and what is bad about the manuscript. And this is really trying to push for, you know, a completely honest, but also constructive, and I would say kind science. So not, not actually, you know, um, um, fighting with each other and um, being mean to each other, which I think early career researchers are experiencing quite frequently, um, or more or less frequently when it comes to the um, typical peer review nowadays where everyone uh, is anonymous and can therefore act in whatever way they want and uh, write whatever comments they want. So um, that's uh, like the sort of early career um, background that I've been talking about. And that's like things that we are discussing within the eLife Early Career Advisory Group. So that's a group of like we always have like roughly 12 or 13 members um, from all around the world, um, really. So finding a meeting time is really difficult. Um, but basically we meet like very often either with each other or with the eLife editorial board or to really support eLife um, and bring the early career uh, researcher perspective in. So we really push for more openness and transparency, but also for more equity, inclusion and fairness uh, in science when it comes to early career researchers, but also to minorities, because that's another important aspect in the current peer review um, process. Often minorities are being disadvantaged even more because they are not um, equally represented by in both the editorial board and also by reviewers. Um, so this is why making the reviews publicly available, what I mentioned earlier, can be of a lot of interest because we can actually understand this bias and actually see if it has an impact on the actual evaluation um, of the preprints. Um, yeah, so I think uh, um, I very much agree with um, the sort of uh, uh, very um, let's say, a sort of negative assessments that we've had at the beginning right now. I think it can't continue uh, as it um, has been happening right now, especially because, um, also as Uli mentioned, uh, publications and the impact factor of the respective journals are our currency. So I think this is like the most important thing that we as scientists have to regulate properly to assure that our careers and our application processes for positions and so on can be really um, um, yeah, equitable and, and just. So I think it's, it will be really exciting to discuss how we can go forward from here, given that we have a quite established and um, fi financial system, so people are profiting financially from this, so how do we go from here and get rid of this? Thank you. Thank you, Lara. So last but not least, we have uh, Michael Hefner with us. He is professor for communication psychology at the Berlin University of Arts, and his research interests lie in questions on emotional processes and empathy, and he is also uh, a permanent, permanent member of the Ethics Committee at the Technical University of Berlin. And probably uh, not only there, but also in seminars, you keep uh, reflecting on different approaches to peer review, Michael. What do you think are the essential criteria to criticize peer review in a productive and maybe visionary and uh, more optimistic way? Um, difficult. Hi, hi everybody, and thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, it's already fun listening to all the positions, and I'm I'm very curious about the discussion that we that we're gonna have right away. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Well, well, just for the fun of it, let let me take the position. Peer review is great, and uh, it'll be the future, and uh, all is fine. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Actually, I, I would subscribe to, to most of the, the things that have been uh, brought up. Um, also from my, from my own experience, I've served as an associate editor for 10 years uh, and, and just got rid of that job. Um, liked it and, and worked 
a lot, uh, um, but there are very, very deep problems to the review system as we have it. And, and to make a long story short, I think, and, and that may even subsume what has been said up to now, I think there are at least two core problems in the system. One of which being that it's a person-centered system. So we're not talking about science, but we're talking about persons and careers and currencies that make us get jobs, that make us get funding, etc. So it's all about persons, whereas it should be about science. So it's, it's a system meant to advance science and advance knowledge. Uh, but as a matter of fact, it doesn't because we act as gatekeepers and it's for one reason or the other, many people tend to rather reject papers that are submissed uh, uh, rather than accepting them. And that's the second thing. I, th I think solidarity is, is a, a major keyword in the process or should be because, uh, well, as a reviewer, um, you have to be solidary and you, you have to like uh, put in your time and effort uh, in order to come up with a good review. Um, um, but also uh, on the other side, you, you should be solidary as, as someone who publishes papers. Um, uh, and I, I think um, uh, uh, one other currency, just to throw that in, should be that every paper you publish should cost at least 10 reviews. So for every paper that you publish, you have to um, do 10 reviews for what journal ever. Uh, and maybe that would help a little bit. But, and that's also from personal experience because I'm, I'm working in a very interdisciplinary field. I work at the Berlin University of the Arts as a psychologist, maybe the, the only psychologist at the whole university. And I'm doing empirical research. And uh, uh, people often don't get me and don't get what I do, uh, which is a very, uh, a very interesting uh, context. But what I learned immediately is that they handle very different standards and they couldn't understand why we in psychology, and as I understand it also in medicine and many other fields, people in the journals and, and in the review process act as gatekeepers with a very negative mindset, um, whereas they were completely different, uh, differently in the arts. It's like, oh yeah, let's work on it and let's make this happen. And that's something that we've lost in the review process, I think, because it's not working on papers, but it's about rejecting papers uh, uh, quite often. And that kills the system. And uh, so uh, uh, finally, I'm, I'm subscribing to the view of the others, uh, peer review as it is, is dead and we have to do something about it. But I don't know what, uh, I, I tried, I worked as an, an, uh, on the editorial board uh, for uh, Frontiers because I thought maybe that more interactive review system would work. But that's frankly bullshit. It doesn't work at all, I think. So that's it for now. I see hands raising. That's great. Let's discuss. Thanks a lot. So I guess all hands are up. I have a ton of questions, but I, I leave it to you first. So it will be useful. Um, I, I, I just want to pick up on, on the thought that Michael just had um, and expand it. Um, because, I mean, we are generalizing when we say peer review, we're generalizing over so many different fields. And that may be uh, unjust or, or not, not a proper approach um, to, to illustrate this. Um, in, in sort of in my little world, um, take basic, um, basic medic biomedical research and take papers in cell. I, I, um, I sometimes in, in my talks, you talks use a, a panel from a cell paper. It was the supplement figure number seven, and it runs from A to Z panel. So it has 26 little, they look like stamps. This is figure uh, supplementary figure seven. So this is a paper that has like 20 such, 26, uh, it's extreme. But the point I want to make is to rev it is impossible. I, I, I would challenge anyone uh, who, who would argue to the opposite that it is impossible for two or three people 
to to judge on such a paper because there's so much in it. I mean, this is almost, I mean, it's a positive statement. This is, this is great science. And there's, there's so much methods in it. There's so much data in it. There's so much stuff. Uh, you would probably need a team of 20 people because it was done by 30 people. You need 20 people to sift through all this, to, to study, maybe to even go to the lab, to look at what they're doing, to really assess what was done compare this and this is impossible such a paper it, they are reviewed but I don't, I don't buy into it take a clinical study in the new england journal of medicine uh, clinical studies have kind of a there, there's a blueprint for it and the clinical epidemiology has kind of its methods and it's pretty straightforward there may be exceptions but most of those papers two clinical epidemiologists and and a, and a statistician they look at this and one guy from the field they can look at this and say this is bogus this is good research, uh, or and and really judge on the quality and filter it if uh, if you want to use this as a as a as a term. So uh, even in the field of biomedicine and and you mentioned the arts and so forth, th this is I think uh, we need to discriminate between between different domains, and um, a lot of this I don't think can be reviewed, <laughs> and some others could be reviewed and then. So, so that, that, that's just a point I want to expand. That doesn't sound very good for that interdisciplinary approach of being like within one field, it gets so specialized that it's even in one field difficult to, to assess papers. So feel free to jump in. I think I don't have to, to pick you as we did it in school, so. May I then? Um... Thanks. So I also want to comment on, on what Michel uh, said, uh, well, the, the other Michel. Um, first of all, um, well, okay, I, I have to confess, obviously, I, I do appreciate the, or the ideal itself, and I learned a lot from the reviews I got, and it's not that my opinion is entirely negative, uh, and actually, um, all of the reviews I received were, uh, were contributed to my papers well, enormously, one can say, uh, to make suggestions how to make the system better, obviously transparency, uh, but that's pretty much, it's obvious. Um, and there are also other venues that should be uh, um, considered in the humanities, the, the well, edited volumes. Uh, this is very common and there the level of peer reviewed reviewing that it is done by the editors. Um, is is let's call it less personal in, well, in one way or another obviously there you have the politics of edited volumes but that's uh, another issue um, but here is another revolutionary suggestion one of the main problems is time eventually people invest a lot of time of writing the reviews of writing a, a good review so reduce my teaching load uh, so i'm talking seriously as a reviewer so that I can produce, that I can do this quality control, because this is the ideal eventually. Um, obviously no one will approve this um, ridiculous proposal of mine, uh, but uh, this is one suggestion, because if we do want some, um, well, a more, let's call it fair society, fair academic society that won't just load more and more assignments on, on poor, um, prof well, professors that have, that have to review and edit and being editors uh, then give something in return. Um, but this is obviously not our decision to make. Yeah, I, I can just say, um, uh, Michael, I totally agree with you um, with respect to that. It should be part of a scientist's um, job description um, to, to include like reviewing or organize it in some other way if people don't want scientists to to take over the, that burden directly. Um, I I don't have a I have a direct comment to what one of the things that Michael Hefner actually uh, said um, previously as well. But but maybe we can then focus more on uh, yeah one one direction and go from one thing to the other. I was just really intrigued, Michael, what you said about um, the the person based system that it's not about the science um, but it's about the people and it's about uh, that publications are important for people's careers and so on. And this is something I've been pondering about recently because 
I, I, I mean, I haven't been in science for, for super long, but what I think has really happened is that it has shifted more um, from the, the, the science that was done in groups um, um, towards that the individual is important. I very much think that this has to do with how the publication system works and how uh, having um, these high impact publications is such an important thing nowadays and that you have your individual name on it or you might not get the next position. And on the other hand, though, that, that, that the focus shifts a little bit to individuals is also a good thing, right? And here I relate to, to, to things that have to do with inclusion and equity and with, you know, that, that we actually um, create an equitable space for, for minorities and look that no one is, is treated um, in, uh, you know, a non-acceptable manner, which I, I, I do think is definitely still happening, but probably has even happened more in the past because of, of just some level of unawareness or um, lack of interest into these sorts of uh, topics. So I think it's it's super interesting to look into how this personalization of science has like good and really bad consequences and to think about uh, how we can bring bring them together and only have the good consequences um, in the long term. And I also found it really interesting what you said about the solidarity, obviously, because that sort of goes a bit into the other direction, right? Like trying to see the individual uh, who is uh, writing a manuscript again who, and who has done all of the research already and uh, and not not just rejecting an article, but trying to, to work together and so on. And here, I think it's super important what Uli also just said at the very beginning, this like that nowadays peer review is post-factual which means all of the research has already been done even the whole manuscript has been written down in a really nice way already people have put a lot of time they've made it specific uh, to the requirements of certain scientific publications and then um, they, they they submit it somewhere and then suddenly all of uh, like this um, negative feedback comes in and you have to incorporate it into an actually already finished study, which I think is also a huge problem. So having these sorts of registered reports starting this peer review from super early on, um, I think would be really important. But as I said, I'm throwing in different ideas here again. So yeah, um, maybe we can focus That's, down one lane. No, no, no. I, I think this is a good idea to just throw things into it and then see what we get out of it. <laughs> So, so maybe I, I can throw a few things more into this bag. Uh, one is I would just uh, uh, disagree with the point that it that we that the the thing moved from from a group to individual historically. It's the other way around. So uh, the authorships, if you look at authorship lists, they had almost one author for 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 hundreds of years, and and now they I think the the mean is seven or eight. Um, and it's it's going in the in, in this uh, group direction, um, but uh, the 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 point I want to make, or, or just as as if we're collecting these ideas, um, one is is an observation, and that is um, uh, there is there is now a great opportunity, and and uh, meta researchers have picked on it. Um, we can now look at preprints uh, in in the biomedical world, and follow them up. What happens if they get published? And this is this is kind of a growing field. Many people are starting this now, and I have seen that not much is published. Some of it is published. I have seen some larger studies that will soon be published. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the interesting fact is that about seventy percent of those preprints that we see in bioarchive or so eventually get published. And if we then compare the preprint version with the published one, um, what do you think? How how different are they? Turns out, not much. So not much has changed. Uh, a few tables may be a little bit different. The spin may be a little bit different. So it is uh, possible to find differences, but it's actually uh, hard <laughs> because, because it, the, the, the papers don't change much, but they have maybe even went, they even went to several review processes because we don't know what happened in between. We only see the published pro So. I think that's an interesting fact. It's not, I think we, we know not everything about it, but it's an, and you could argue what happens to the 30%. Was this the crap that was filtered? And so it's an interesting uh, evolving field. Totally unrelated to this, but something that I think needs to be considered in this discussion is this immense proliferation of outputs that we have, which is crazy, which is part of this currency, this currency thing. It's. It, it does not reflect the, the uh, proliferation of, of, of evidence and, and new knowledge. There is a proliferation of new knowledge, but it, it's, it's kind of super, 
uh, super exponential uh, how, how many papers are written about it. And, and this creates a huge problem, obviously, because then this needs to be uh, curated, it needs to be peer reviewed, it needs to be curated. And, and these papers very often percolate through these tiers. So, so you send it to, we all have these great ideas, let's have a nature paper. So you send it to nature, it flops, you send it to eLife, which is very high, and, and I'm a big fan of eLife. eLife and F1000 uh, Research are my two sort of most favorite journals. You send it to eLife, it's great. You send it, and then it ends in F1000 because eLife, uh, at, at, as for now, as what they are publishing, obviously they need to prioritize. So, and eLife is pretty picky. So, um, this is an immense uh, uh, waste of resources. Um, and it is driven by this, by, this, by this monster machine that produces papers, <laughs> but not necessarily evidence that, is ne that we should read. How do we know that this is, that a lot of this stuff is not necessary? Because it's not quoted. So if you look at the, at the normal citations of papers, <laughs> they're just not read. So um, I think that's that's a, a, also something that needs to put it, be, be put into the bag. What can we do about it? Because uh, the consequence of this would be to publish less. Yeah, but that that's pretty much what I meant when I said it's person centered. It's uh, like persons try to build their career on as many publications as they can, and the salami technique uh, pays off the best. So the the smaller uh, your papers are and the more specific they are the more you can publish them in, in uh, many more different journals and so you you end up having 20 publications more or less telling the same story uh, but you publish them that gets you grant money and uh, that pays off obviously so that's what I meant uh, uh, with person centered and also it pays off to do international collaborations in, in large groups because you can do more research in less time and publish even more papers <laughs> at even more small salami tranches. So that that's really, uh, and I, I, I mean, that, that that's in the system because how else can we measure how good people are in the system? Because that's what we kind of want to know. Right. So, I mean, I don't like it and I don't like counting P's. And that's that's what why I wanted to make one other point drawing on, on what uh, the other Michael uh, said, uh, that editors are very important. And that sounds very old fashioned. It sounds like, uh, no, I'm, I'd rather not say that as an old white man, because it sounds like an, like an old white men club. Uh, uh, but I think editors are very important and the better editors are, the more they work on papers with the authors and the better these papers are. So I, I would, uh, uh, drawing on Ulrich, uh, yes, the more you work on it and the more the paper changes through the review process, I, I would think the more uh, quality it, it brings up. But that's the problem, I mean, that, that we have to solve. I, I know it's time consuming, it's difficult and everything, but we need something to measure quality. And that's so damn difficult. And so what, what happened is we draw on quantity rather than on quality because it's easier. So it's it's counting P's, that's very easy. 20 P's, I'll hire him or her. Uh, 15 P's, I'd rather not hire her or him. It's as easy as that, I think. And, and I mean, hiring myself, what do I look at? First thing, number of publications. Second thing, where are these things published? Third thing, uh, I started reading the papers and then I remind myself, no, 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 no. I'm not going to count publications. No, 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 I'm going for quality. But, but that's so, I mean, you know, I, I don't have a solution and that makes it uh, sad. <laughs> um, yeah, super think, interesting. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, I, I just thought I, I jump in uh, to make it maybe a bit more concrete for, for us as students as we um, never have been peer reviewed or um, have, a, have written some peer, re peer review. And uh, yeah, speaking of quality, so um, Uli, you said in the beginning that, that the method of peer review is not taught. <laughs> uh, 
um, or we, we, we don't learn it really. Um, but at the same time, Michael, you said that you learned a lot from the review you got. So maybe, um, yeah, to, to get some idea what, what good peer review is, what, uh, what were the remarks you, um, you valued in the, um, in, in the peer review? So what, what is good peer, re peer review? Good peer, I think it's pretty pretty straightforward. Good peer peer review is 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 has has a lot of solidarity that 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 was already mentioned. It's it's not gatekeeping. It's about thinking how can I make the uh, what, what can I tell the author to make this a better paper if if necessary. Maybe if you find the the perfect paper, you just congratulate them. But this is very rarely the case. You are asked as a peer reviewer because you're a peer and you're an expert. So you look at it from your expert's uh, mind and you ask yourself, where did they did something wrong? Uh, where did they overstep conclusions? Uh, did they have a flawed analysis? What, whatever. And I think these positive um, um, experiences that we all had, I also had them uh, and plenty of them. I, I said in the beginning, I could also talk about the positive sides of peer review. Um, and these were always peer reviews where they, they, they brought usually a lot of work, but they either prevented me from, from making a fool out of myself because, because a peer reviewer realized that this is, you need to be, you need to think twice, there's another explanation or, or something like that, um, or, or even found a flaw in the analysis or something like that. And, and so I think um, it can be taught this is what we should teach. There should be classes, and in fact, some there are some classes, and and but it's rare, and they should be mandatory. Um, uh, for example, the BMJ has has a very nice course. There are courses on this, but but very few. I would argue that very few reviewers ever went through something like that. And a lot of those reviews that we had, we we feel that they should have had something about it because they were focusing on some arcane stuff in it. They were just they were using language that is in, inappropriate and all kinds of things. So I think it can be, uh, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a one week course and then you're a good reviewer. Can I also just quickly jump in just to briefly say what I wanted to say beforehand, because just because it also relates to, to students and early career researchers and then directly answering the, your question, coming back to what Uli just said as well. So, so just quickly with the few, uh, publishing fewer papers, that's obviously um, a, a, a great idea because it would mean everyone focuses more on putting their papers together, already put some more thoughts um, in before even like submitting them anywhere. And we would need less um, reviewing uh, and editorial force, uh, allowing those people to put more time into each um, of the pieces that they have to review. I, however, think um, just at the moment how the scientific system uh, is, is made up, and I'm sure all of you agree with me, that's just not possible. I know that, especially in Germany, you have certain PhD requirements that you have to publish a minimum number of, of, uh, of publications, which uh, like totally blocks this sort of approach to think, oh, we have one amazing PhD project and we are going to write one nice paper about it. You, you can't do it in your PhD. And I think this is really difficult. Also relating to the, the the evaluation system, so in natural sciences and life sciences, you have the uh, you are very dependent on the age index, which is the number of scientific publications that have been cited at least uh, this number of times. So if you have an age index of ten, you have ten papers that each of them has been cited at least ten times. Same thing, like you, if you have one amazing publication that has been cited ten thousand times. Other people might still have a better age index by throwing out a few smaller papers. So I think that's um, just saying that I think for us early career researchers, we can't even follow this recommendation. It's because we would not succeed in the current scientific system, at least in the life um, scientists, sciences. But then now coming back to, uh, to what we were just um, uh, talking about. Uh, like with, with respect to actually learning to preprint, because I guess here I have to mention that this is something that eLife really, uh, at learning to peer review, sorry, that eLife is really trying to push as well. Um, so they are, for example, collaborating um, with um, the um, organization called Pre Review. Um, which is basically a preprint community um, to get early feedback on work. So you can register there for free 
and uh, like either voluntarily review yourself or put your work out there and let it be reviewed. And then you can even team up with more senior people. You can get feedback on your review. So it's like a really nice way of, of getting into this, this reviewing system, I think. And further, eLife is also um, uh, co-organizing the society platform. So it's society without the O. Um, which uh, tries to support like this open evaluation and curation of, of preprints as well, which means you can actually access all peer reviews that have been written about a certain paper via this platform and the paper itself directly as well. So where I think it's also an amazing way of learning what is important and to see how others do it. But now I let the others comment on this. Thanks. Actually, have well another well Elizabeth, you ask what is well a good peer review. I well, let's take the opposite. Obviously, a, a bad peer review is one that attacks you personally. Uh, and I think all of the young career researchers and postdocs and docs, I think the first lesson, even before you submit your first paper, uh, is just to memorize. Never take it personally. I know it's extremely hard, um, but uh, I think one should know that at least as a, as a young researcher, most of the community just doesn't know you eventually. Uh, so I think this is the first thing to remember. Um, yeah, reviews can be mean and people can be nasty, um, but to be honest, this is life. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, on another matter, uh, uh, this is a side comment. Uh, uh, I think with, because it just popped my mind with respect to what uh, Michel said, um, that is, um, I think that the current system should be changed also well, the, the, also for the, let's call it the senior um, researchers, that is professors, etc. Because if I get money from the university as a kind of benefit, uh, the moment I published, for example, free papers in a tier one um, journal pro year uh, that means that i will eventually um well prefer just to publish more and more um i think most most of i know if most but a lot of professors will think like that um and this is really a, a major disadvantage also this uh, for example i don't know if it's really relevant but in the humanities um you have this equation a book equals five papers. Well, that's a, how do you even, <laughs> it, it, it's just such a bizarre thought, <laughs> like the salami uh, trenching that you mentioned. Um, but yeah, well, the, the, this quantity measurement, the, they should be changed, that, that's obvious. I, I just had a small uh, anecdote on what, what is a good review because actually that was my first paper and maybe that's why I uh, think so much about review systems and why I became an editor myself because I uh, I, I uh, submitted a horrible paper. Uh, it was really horrible. I mean, the research was good, the, the idea was great, the data was good, but it was horribly written. It was really horrible uh, uh, in terms of English, in terms of uh, uh what i told uh, in in terms of the narrative and, and everything but the editor uh managed to look through it and she worked with me like through i i think six or seven rounds of reviews she looked over the horrible reviews that i got like telling me that it was horrible as i can now see and uh, I ended up publishing my first paper in that beautiful journal and I got a prize for it. it. It was my first paper and I got the early career award from that journal. And I, I really dedicated it to the editor because it was basically her, uh, uh, it was her work. Um, but, but that's what I meant. I mean, as an editor, you have to, you have to decide and you don't have to, uh, be afraid of making decisions uh, because, of course, as an editor, that, that's another side of the game. You're also the target of, of uh, bad wishes <laughs> and uh, um, bad echo. And you, can ha you, you have to handle that, uh, actually, but you have to make decisions and you have to be willing to work 
with people. And that's uh, really a different mindset. Like uh, uh, the mindset I think should be, let's make this a publishable, acceptable work. If data is fine and, and if the basis methodologically is fine, then let's make this work. That should be the mindset and, uh, and not the mindset Oh, let me keep the gate for getting money, etc., etc., etc. And just on a side note, uh, like getting uh, time for reviewing or something. I, I spent 10 years of my academic life in the Netherlands, uh, and they have a, a very strict system, uh, very macho, elbow-like, but you get time for everything. So you get actually, the more you review, the less you have to teach. The more editorial work you do, the less you have to teach. The more research you do and the more you publish, the less you have to teach, uh, okay. But it, it pays off in that system. And that helps because people do editorial work. Uh, and here I have the feeling, at least as an editor, it was more and more difficult finding reviewers, but it was also more and more difficult finding people for uh, an editorial board because it doesn't pay off. On the contrary, it makes you uh, uh, like the target of, of other people if you make bad decisions in their eyes. You just got back to the statement that, that you also made at the beginning, Michael, about solidarities, meaning let's make this work publishable. And I, I, that still sticks into my head because what I find most strange about the peer review system is, as we also discussed, it's we are operating in a highly competitive setting. And then, then we put a system in there that relies on, on goodwill and kind of solidarity, which, which just doesn't make sense to me. And I would give into the round also the, the question whether other disciplines have approaches to that. Because it was many times you said, we need a different perspective. We need a different mindset. So maybe we don't find that in life sciences. Probably we don't. But how about other, other sciences, other fields? Is there anything? It's the same. D don't worry. That is obviously in. I'm talking from the the history of mathematics. So obviously there, the well, the the, the data is not getting outdated. Um, but uh, so, you, but obviously there the, the same worries. That is theft, for example, or mean peer reviews and etc. Um, it's that's well, the, the research, so to say, is, is less urgent than the natural sciences. But um, it's not that in other disciplines you have um, other magnificent models that you can adopt. Um, so, yeah. But I'm pessimistic in that case. So, <laughs> I also think that competition in principle is not the problem. Um, in fact, Without competition, it it well, we, we, we should try. It's an interesting experiment to set up a system somewhere where there's no competition and see what happens. But it's probably something that is kind of built in uh, in our brains and and to we want to be, I don't know, the first and, and a bit better than others. And and I think that's a driving force. Uh, it's always talked that science is about curiosity. That's true, but it's also about getting acknowledged for for doing good stuff and getting famous not rich maybe but famous for for a brilliant invention or something that discovery so i think um and and that's the history of modern science is that it hasn't changed it's 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 always about this and, and it was that with hook and 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 newton and um and also with robert koch and uh, i don't know um francis crick um, what has changed, I think, um, and there was maybe none of you uh, were there. There was uh, two days ago, was it? Yet? No, yesterday uh, at the Boer conference, uh, Lauren Dostin, she's a science historian, gave a, a, a beautiful talk about, about sort of how this evolved. And, and she made the point, and I think it's, it's, it's absolutely correct. Uh, this has not changed. 
and it will not change. But what has changed is the scale of the operation. And it's kind of hyper. It's it's so it's so overloaded and, and so so much of it that we, we are now in a situation where we can only deal or think. So the, I, I have some ideas and many people have some ideas how this could at least be rolled back a little bit. But the only way to deal with it now is with quantitative metrics. Because how would you rate hundreds of people? And because the system is not only about papers, by the way. She showed graphs about researchers. And I also did some, some uh, number crunching only recently. I'm not sure whether you know that. I mean, just, just make a guess how many researchers, people who live, make a living on research, uh, live in Germany. More than 400,000. And worldwide, there are, I forgot the number. I mean, it's, 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 it's mind boggling. She, she showed it and, and it goes like this. There's an ever increasing number and it's not, I'm not criticizing this. It's good. Um, and the reason for this is probably because, because it's getting more and more complex to find something new. We are, we have the low hanging fruits have been picked. Gravity, I mean, E equals M square, uh, MC square has been already, someone has done it. So this goes up like this. And this is a, and, and, and these people produce papers. And I think this has, is something that has to be dealt with. And the, the way we are dealing it right now with is, is quantitative metrics, impact factor, number of papers, uh, these things. And it's understandable because it's, it's, it's quantitative and it gives us a handle on these things. But it's also what got us in the, into this problem. So um, I think these are the things we need to think about. What else is there? And I, I don't want to monopolize here. So, but maybe for if we in the end collect some ideas, what, what could be done? I, I have some ideas how we can um, at least try to um, roll back a little bit on this. I just have a side comment to, to what you in, in just said, uh, and that is that, that the exponential rise in the number of researchers actually led to the fact that the job market is extremely precarious because obviously you don't have the same rise in the number of jobs and that actually just motivates people write more and more and more. Uh, and so uh, there are all obviously negative side effects to this rise in the number of researchers and, and one of the solutions would be obviously to write less um, but then where would be the jobs um, but, but that's it and I, I have to say maybe I'm still a bit too idealistic about this after I, I definitely don't have like the editorial um, and reviewing experience that, that um, you have had but I think that to, to some extent, because of how specialized scientists have to be nowadays and how also not comparable that makes them across the board. We have to make the effort to look into each person's science and, and uh, experience before hiring someone. I, I think, um, I, I don't think that, that Uli said anything against that, but I think, um, uh, you know, sure, an age index is, is nice and easy, but it will not tell us if a person suits into a job um, or not. And I, I, I do think it's possible to take the time to see who you want to hire, because after all, it's the people who do the science. So this is where we have to invest our time, probably better to invest the time into that than to into reviewing too many papers where we come back to just reducing the amount of papers that, that are being published. And I have to say just out of very recent experience, when I had my first PI interview for my position next year, then I, I have been really positively surprised about how much time was taken for um, many applicants for, for one position um, and how, uh, you know, they all were given quite some space um, to discuss everything. I mean, not a lot of time, but at least, you know, I think 10 minutes can be a lot already if you if you actually have time to discuss um, something this time. And I think in, in the end, um, the decisions also like are not not only based about the science in itself always, but also how you think you could work with a certain person in in the future, and that's just a, a human thing, right? So, I think I think we just have to yeah really make the space and put the time into like offering people the floor to present themselves fully and to see if they fit into a, a certain position or not. 
I, I do I ideologically I guess that would would be the best. So going visionary now. <laughs> um, as far as I understood, a good a good peer review uh, system would be something like uh, first of all uh, only those papers. So this is really idea idea uh, idealistic, but yeah, but only those papers. Um, who want to be written are written and published and uh, are reviewed transparently. Uh, and numbers don't matter um, in your career as, um, as the main um, market value or something like that. Is this, yeah, is this maybe... Um, a vision that you would share and where yeah. would be the flaws so i think i think uh, um um lara has already mentioned it i think uh elife is pretty much um getting there um and and f1000 research is pretty pretty much uh, the same um elife has a higher reputation and they, they will probably get a lot more uh, attractive papers for this but I think, um, as, and I, I, I'm not sure, I don't think they are, they have fully uh, established it or, or they have the engine to do it, but they don't do it completely. But the, the system they are heading for, to my understanding, is that they only publish papers that are, uh, uh, that, are that already have been a preview, a, a preprint. So that's the first step. You need a preprint. This gives exposure of, of this, uh, of this, piece of evidence of this study to the community and the community can can discuss it and so forth then it is being reviewed and it's openly being it, it's an it's an open peer review idea at least not sure whether this is this is what they will do in the end but to me this would be the obvious choice an open peer review of this and then the journal that does all this work i mean um, well it doesn't come for free they can decide whether they are going to publish it or not. So this could go into eLife. If eLife, the editor or the board says, well, this fits our portfolio and it's, it's, it's interesting enough to our readership, we have to defend our impact factor, although they say we, don't, we, we are not interested. But in a way, they, they need to be interested because an impact factor, by the way, for a journal is something different than for, a, for, a, for, a, for an author. So... And if they don't take it, it's a paper that has two or three reviews attached to it and is in the public domain. Well, it's maybe not as formatted as it is in eLife or in another journal, but it's perfectly there. And you can read about it in terms of what do the referees say? Do they say this is crap? In, in F1000 research, you get a like an approved or not approved. If it's not approved, it will not move from preprint pre to being published in F1000 research, but it is, um, it's there, it's in the record. And it attached is the criticism of these referees. And it's so beautiful that this is, these are open reviews because it means that the, the, the referees get accountable for it. So they, uh, it, it, many people criticize this and say, well, then they can write anything and there are these, these networks. But this would be so obvious. I mean, if you if this is a bad paper and you write about it and you say this is a great paper, it, it's on you. You're the idiot, and everyone will see it. So you better have, make a good review for this. Or if you use language that is inappropriate, all those things, it all falls back on you as the referee. The only problem with this is the system that we have that you cannot do it as a as an early career researcher because if you say this is a shitty paper and it is a shitty paper, you may get serious trouble later on when you apply for a job but so what i'm saying is there are already a few journals out there and and these two i think are extremely good examples that are are pushing the envelope and i think they're pretty close to to where i think this this system can go without major changes in 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 the in the overall system which which we also need but having just these journals like, like F1000 and Research and, and eLife um, and many more of them would, I think, make a big difference already. Or if you think about setting up your own journal, uh, this would be, I think th these are the model journals, I think, for it. 
Yeah, thanks a lot, Uli, for for describing eLife so well. I mean, as as you know, I'm I'm a big fan of the concept as well, and obviously of F1000 as well. So just to really quickly um, uh, throw in a few things that I realized while Uli was explaining that so nicely. So it's indeed like so if you submit something to eLife and you haven't pre-printed it yet, eLife is going to pre-print it for you. So specifically for the life sciences, they are going to put it out in bioarchive to make sure that everything they review is really um, out there available already. And this open peer review um, is um, fantastic. Um, it's like some researchers, so we are also conducting a lot of polls amongst researchers, amongst others, to get a feeling of what the scientific community is sort of ready for. And several researchers have been a bit anxious about having these peer reviews out there before they actually get to publish their paper. But this is due to the current system that we still have. So at the moment, eLife still offers that if um, the peer reviews are more negative, that they only publish them after the respective manuscript has been accepted at another uh, scientific uh, journal, which long-term scene is not the ideal thing because as Uli said, you want to have those out there, um, but this is to you know, slowly adapt the scientific community um, to this. It definitely has a huge impact on the language of the reviewers. So my, um, uh, my, one of my uh, publications um, of my, my PhD, I submitted to eLife and that's how I got interested in eLife and uh, ended up applying for the role as an, in the early uh, career advisory group. Uh, it was a crazy experience for me. It's such a nice language, so friendly, um, like sure they criticize things, but in a very constructive manner. And that's how, you know, I think I really got convinced um, of this whole system because we knew the names of the reviewers, they knew who we were, and it was all put out there and is now available together with, with our manuscript um, on eLife. And also one other point that um, I think we haven't really mentioned so much yet is that eLife commits um, very early to actually publishing something. So after the first round of peer reviews comes in, they will basically tell you, hey, yeah, we go down the route with you and then they commit to publishing it. Or they will at that point say, yeah, sorry, um, we give you the peer reviews, already a great service, but we are not going to publish it in eLife. So that they commit early is super important because what you guys might end up being stuck in at some point is to um, like having several peer review rounds at a journal and then they suddenly decide to reject it and think about how much time that takes and then you have to go to the next journal and all the time if you don't preprint like your work is not out there and others might be doing the very same thing or might be doing the research without being informed about what you have already achieved. So I think that this is also a super important aspect um, to, to, to know, hey, I'm, I'm going to work with these people very much what, what Michael was telling us. Yeah, I'm going to work with the editor, but I also can be certain that it will be published in eLife afterwards. Thank you. So we moved quite a lot into that direction, what could be changed. And as we are now also moving to our Q&A, section and therefore we'll also close the recording. I'd like to have kind of a very short round, just some flashlights. And for that, I'd like to give you that perspective, thinking of your PhD student you're currently mentoring, for example. What do you wish that PhD student to start off his or her career? What mindset, what things in, in his or her head. So just some spotlights, and then we go for the questions of the audience. I mean, I would really wish um, that, and also some PhD students I'm co-supervising currently, that they could just go off afterwards and have this completely free mind and, and you know, like really, um, you know, go into high risk uh, science if they want. Um, to do something that hasn't been there yet, you know, like, and um, really, you know, try try to push the boundaries of science further. But this is just not what I'm seeing at the moment because like most of the PhD students who I currently know here in New Zealand are really afraid um, of the financial future that they face because especially in New Zealand, there's just not a lot of funding for research. Plus at the moment, not anyone necessarily wants to leave New Zealand because the COVID-19 situation has just been so good here. So it sort of seems, you know, like leaving a safe heaven to leave New Zealand right now. Um, and 
so so I think like they they really go in, into their scientific career with the idea of how can I get many publications? How can I have a good age index? And not with the idea of how can I use my, my science to revolutionize a field or maybe even to contribute to societal benefits and tackle grand challenges that, that we currently have in our society, including COVID-19. So I think it's like, um, yeah, I think that's what I would, would like to say. So I don't want to end on a, on a bad note. Um, and yeah. I think I think that's that's where we have to work for as you know more established or me slowly becoming an established um, scientist to to allow younger scientists to do this again also for our own benefits. That was long flashlight. Anything else? Yeah, I will. Uh, I, I would like to support Lara, but on, on the same note, I have to say, well, I think PhD students it, they should also be will have a realistic mindset that is just get to know the systems before you're turning into a postdoc if you manage to be one uh, and that is exactly know how or where one should publish that is apart from uh, on what do sh they should work and be rev revolutionary etc i think the dream of every uh, phd student is uh, have the next um, revolution in physics or chemistry or whatever um, i think they should know much more um, what is the system actually, w w or what is expected? Uh, because they're not, they are not in a position to change it. And this is, well, a problem, obviously, but. Um, yeah, Michael, just just very quickly to 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 uh, clarify, sure, like that's but that's exactly the problem, right? That I I wouldn't want anyone to have to go into such a system as a highly educated person and then face financial um, insecurities, whereas they could really have they require an ease of mind to do good research, and that's not what we give them at the moment, and I think that's the problem. But I'm always I'm thinking like really we have to we have to change the system long term. I don't know if it's possible, but I I will work towards it. I'll continue with a very small flashlight, uh, very short. Uh, I, I wish my PhD students that they are uh, that they have the the time and space to focus on uh, on their research, on their methods, on good research questions, rather than looking around them what is on vogue uh, or what is publishable at the moment, and not caring so much about stories around uh, what they're doing, but good research and, and not the narrative around it and, and all the other uh, stuff that is around it. Focus on good questions, good methodology. And, and so far, I find the review process at PLOS One uh, um, uh, fairly good uh, because they focus on, focus on methods and do nothing with the rest, uh, more or less. Well, I agree with everything that has been said, especially with the last uh, comment on focus on methods and learning, learning the tools of the trade. Uh, and that is not cutting corners, but rather doing real science. Um, my, I have to say, because it came up so often, my, um, I've spent most of my time now changing the system. And, and I'm in a privileged situ situation uh, that comes with age and, having sat on committees for the rest of, I don't know, for, for the last 10 or 20 years or whatnot. So um, I think my generation, um, we need to, we are in the in a position to change the system. I mean, others can help, but but that's, it comes from committees. It comes from people who sit in the DFG commissions it, on, on search committees and so forth. Um, and in, in uh, the deans and so forth. Uh, so, so my focus is, uh, because it was mentioned in this, that there are so many things I focus on, but one is to change the PhD regulations because they are with, with these numbers of, of uh, publications that you need. Um, I, my focus is on changing how we select professors. Um, we, we are switching now to narratives. Um, we, we blank out the, we, we have in our system where when you apply at the Charité and, and you apply for, for, you have to, you cannot send in stuff, you have to go through a website. And, and there you type in your papers, in fact, they, they are imported. And then what the committee sees first is just the, the title, it, it, it's blanked out in the DOI. They, they can then, if they want, 
download, whether it's a nature paper or a PLOS paper or whatever. But first, it's just a title. And then next to it, it there's a, a 500 character narrative. Why did I choose this paper as part as number one, two, three, four, five? So why did I choose it? Then what was my contribution to it? And then we have questions like, um, did you publish null results? Did you do any replications? Did you publish your protocols? Stuff like that. And these are all narratives. And so the committees need to focus on this. This is this is uh, this is hard. They have to learn this. <laughs> so so I have I have a person who goes into these committees. We we call her the good scientific practice officer, a good evaluation practice officer. And and so so it's like a like a, a Gleichstellungsbeauftragte. So she has to to say well. You talked a lot about nature papers, but have you read them? So what can you tell me what's in the nature paper and stuff like that? So this is, I think, and and I'm in a privileged situation to, to be able to do that. Um, but, um, and there are others doing stuff like that. So this is why I'm, I'm not saying that system change is imminent, but I think that there is there are scratches in, in the system and there are people who work from the inside to change it. One last comment. Maybe I already said that. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's getting late. Um, there is a committee of the DFG that, that is about to, and I'm part of it. It's a presidential committee of the, and, and we are charged with a change of the, C, of the CV of the, that is, that needs to be submitted with the, um, with the applications and and these are the first steps so that you devalue those papers but 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 then you have narratives with it and stuff like that and and it's happening so the question is how long will it take i'm not sure thank you very much i really like starting off with uh, and, and having you last or the end having that very different perspectives and coming from very concrete peer review discussion or discussion about peer review ending up with discussion about the, the whole system. So thank you for all the points that you made. And we'll now close the reporting and